likely know this song and there's a good chance you can even play it. In this video, I'm gonna share with you why I think the Beatles song Blackbird is the perfect acoustic guitar piece. Before we start analyzing the musical side of things, let's quickly look at the history of this song. It was released in 1968 on the ninth Beatles studio album, commonly called The White Album. It was written solely by Paul McCartney around the time the Beatles spent some time in India. On a double album with a variety of sounds and styles, Blackbird is beautiful in its simplicity. There are only four sound sources on the recording, Paul McCartney's foot taps, his acoustic guitar, his voice, and the sound of a bird chirping. Though he said that the guitar part was partially inspired by memories of learning box Boree in E minor as a child, and lyrically it's a song about the civil rights movement in America, this, like many of his greatest works, was an example of spontaneous creativity, as if the song just kind of stumbled out of his soul into the world with hardly any work. I don't think there's a lot of people that would say that this is necessarily one of the best Beatles songs, which is more of a nod to how impressive their catalog was than a knock on Blackbird itself. But I do think that this is the perfect acoustic guitar song. Let's check out the music and I'll tell you why. All right, before we start breaking this down, I'll let you know that I'm gonna to try to make all the musical concepts we talk about as accessible as possible, but a firm grasp of music theory is gonna make understanding this stuff and everything you do in music so much simpler. And for that, I'd recommend my courses over at samuraiguitartheory.com. Specifically my courses, The Rudiments and Beyond the Basics, which take a look at music theory from the initial building blocks, working up to substantially more advanced topics. They're geared towards guitar players and they're animated so that the tough stuff that people often get hung up on is easy to understand. If you're a musician looking to take your craft to the next level and understand why music works the way it does, this is the resource that I wish I had when I was learning this stuff. I've also got a couple promo codes left over from the sale that I did a few weeks ago. Everything in the store is half off. If you use code second greatest at checkout, you can find more information at samuraiguitar3.com. I'll also put up links in the description. Anyways, let's get back to it. Now this song really only has two parts. There's what I'll call the main section and then a shorter bridge. We'll break them down individually, starting with part one, the main section, it sounds like this. Honestly, I feel like I could play just that little guitar bit over and over for hours on end and be completely satisfied. I'm not going to for everyone else's sake, but I feel like I could. Anyways, let's talk about what's going on here. We start off with a G chord, then A minor seven, then a G with a root on the B, and then all the way up to another G chord, an octave higher. It's a nice ascending bass part. If you listen for it, each one of those chords has an open G string ringing out. Nothing too crazy here, but the fun's about to begin. We now have the C followed by a C sharp diminished, D, D sharp diminished, and E minor. Now you'll notice that these aren't your typical bar chords, they're stripped down shell voicings. Instead of your typical C bar chord, which has four notes, we're only fretting these two notes here, and then we keep the open G ringing out throughout. Make a note of that, we're gonna come back to it a bit later. But what I wanna look at now is what's going on with the bass notes of these chords. It's interesting stuff. We ascend chromatically from a C up to an E. There's certainly some cool stuff going on here. Now the song is set in the key of G, which includes the chords C, D, and E minor. Those chromatic diminished chords, however, aren't from the key, but they add a lovely sense of tension leading to the next chord. I've said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it again, but the idea of tension and release is a key musical component. This is a perfect example of it. The C, D, and E minor don't offer much tension. They're what the ear expects to hear in this setting. On the other hand, a D sharp diminished chord sounds tense, it sounds unresolved, it sounds like it needs to go somewhere. And it feels so good when you play a diminished chord and then resolve it one half step higher to a chord tone. Take a listen to this again with that in mind. Using chords like this that don't come from the overarching key to create tension draws from a technique called secondary dominance and really what we're doing here is playing with the listener's expectations. You play something that isn't especially common 
and it's gonna perk up the ear. But you're also not taking something from way out in left field that's gonna sound horribly out of place and grating. There's gotta be some strategy behind it. You wanna find the balance between something being boring and predictable and being completely unexpected and harsh. Cool things happen in the middle here and that's where Paul McCartney's hanging out. Now I should make a quick note that I'm referring to this shape as a D and this shape as a D sharp diminished which they would be if it weren't for that open G ringing out, which turns them into a D add four and some weird chord that would resemble a Wi-Fi password. In my mind, I'm thinking of the notes that I'm fretting as one thing, and then that open G that rings out the entire song is kind of another thing. And having that G drone in there is another one of those little things that makes a song so great it rings out the entire song, which is something you can find in a decent amount of traditional Indian music. And if you recall, Paul McCartney wrote this song while the Beatles were traveling to India. I wouldn't be surprised if the concept of the G drone string was something that sunk its way into his subconscious while he was absorbing the Indian culture. But the musical implication here is that we're weaving in and out of G major for the entire song, but having that G drone string ringing out keeps the chord progression grounded. It gives us a sense of consistency that keeps everything rooted. It sounds interesting and unique while also maintaining a sense of familiarity. Again, we're hanging out in this middle area where cool things happen. Let's see where we go next. We left off at an E minor and we're gonna descend down the same bass notes chromatically. E minor, E minor major seven. That's interesting. We should know that one. D again. C sharp diminished, C, and oh, what's this? C minor. We should note that one too. Going from E minor to E minor major seven, super cool. E minor major seven comes from the E harmonic minor, slightly different than G, but closely related. Again, Paul's playing with our expectations masterfully. And no point here is he serving us that unexpected total curveball. He's not giving us a beautiful dish of nigiri sushi and then dumping ketchup and cheddar cheese over top of it. No, that would be disgusting. But rather, he's taking that beautiful piece of sushi, putting some oil over top of it, lightly searing the fish, and then dusting it with some shiso leaf. It's unexpected, but it makes sense, and it's certainly delicious. And the other noteworthy chord here is a C minor. Let's do a bit of analysis. The fourth chord in a G major scale is C major. But check this out. The fourth chord in a G minor scale is a C minor. Paul plays the chord that we expect first, and then borrows a chord from the minor version of the scale. The technical term for this is the subdominant minor, and it's the whole shiso leaf blowtorch sushi thing again. You just gotta freaking love it. We now end this section with another G chord where the lowest note is a B, then an A7. That's notable, that's not what we would expect. We'll come back to that. Then D7, and finally home bass, G. Using an A7 here, it's the same idea as those diminished chords that we saw earlier. We would expect to hear an A minor chord, but by turning it into an A7, it creates that heightened sense of tension, which then pushes into the D7. But this chord is also still unresolved. So now we're feeling the weight of two unresolved chords, which makes the payoff that much better when we finally head home to the G chord. The non-musician would never know what's going on here, and I seriously doubt that Paul McCartney approached this song from a theoretical standpoint, but we can all instinctually hear that there's something especially engaging about the Blackbird chord progression, at least more so than if Paul had picked all the most obvious chord choices. In fact, why don't we do that? Let's replace all the chord twists with the obvious choices and see what that would have sounded like. You can hear how when you take this stuff out, it loses a lot of the magic. And if you're a musician, you can take some of these concepts that we've looked at, 
put them in your toolbox, and then when you're writing your own music, you can pull that tool out if it makes sense. Let's move on to part two of this song, the bridge. It sounds like this. Here we have those shell voicings again, starting with an F, E minor. Though since this chord only has two notes, you could also think of it as an E half diminished. Then we have a D minor, C, B flat, and back to the C. We were in the key of G, but that chord progression was in the key of F. And the way that Paul McCartney executed this key change, in my opinion, was very good. We're already familiar with the chords in G, but let's look at F. The key of F has the chords F, G minor, A minor, B flat, C, D minor, E half diminished, and then back to F. More than half the chords are different than G. Jumping between these two keys should sound a bit abrasive, right? Well, check this out. The key of C has the chords C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B half diminished. As you can see, the key of C and G only have two different chords in them. And the beginning of the Blackbird Bridge goes F, E minor, D minor, C, all of which are from the key of C. As well, they all come from the key of F. Hearing these four chords after hearing a whole bunch of G chords earlier in the song implies that we're in the key of C, which isn't too huge of a shift. C and G are closely related. They're like cousins and transitioning between the two keys is hardly offensive. But the next chord in the progression is a B flat, which strongly implies F major. And the brilliance here is that by placing this B flat chord near the end of the progression, it gradually eases us into the shift. We start by hearing G major, which eases into C major, which eases into F. This is a lot easier to digest than just jumping from G to F. It's like if your friend introduces you to one of their friends, it's gonna be a lot more comfortable than if you just meet some rando and hope to hit it off. And let's talk about the impact that this key change has. We've been led into this new musical space, which naturally shines a spotlight on this part of the song. And I think it's especially interesting that as the chords descend and the melody descends, the lyric is Blackbird Fly. And I know I'm getting a little English teachery here, but it's as if that blackbird is trying to fly, but something is pulling it back down to earth, that thing being symbolized by the music. However, at the end of the bridge, we shift back into G, the chords ascend, the melody lifts, and the lyric goes, into the light of a dark black night. And to me, it just feels like that bird has now escaped whatever was holding it back. There's a reason why Sir Paul McCartney is considered one of the greatest songwriters of all time, and it's little things like this. Now, as I mentioned before, I don't think that Paul planned a lot of this stuff out. He wasn't approaching it from an analytical angle, but it just goes to show you how great his instincts were. A lot of these musical techniques that we've looked at here are used heavily in the Great American Songbook, those old Broadway show tunes and jazz standards that a guy like Paul McCartney was certainly influenced by. He certainly didn't invent these things, but hearing it played by a rock band, especially a rock band as influential as the Beatles, is substantially less common. The sophistication of this progression fits the song perfectly, and it just sounds so effortless. And maybe one of the best things about it is it's also incredibly easy to play. Most of the chords require no more than two fingers, and you're only really moving a handful of shapes around the neck. It's accessible, but it also sounds great. I've heard beginners play this and sound wonderful, and I've also heard advanced musicians play this who were able to extract a whole bunch of interesting things out of those complicated chords. It feels so good, it's fun to play. It's one of those things that would never have been written on anything besides an acoustic guitar. I strongly believe that this is the perfect acoustic guitar song, and to wrap this up, I'm gonna play you my version of Blackbird arranged for two guitars. Hope you enjoy.
Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Blackbird by the Beatles, in my opinion, the perfect acoustic guitar song. If any of the musical concepts that we talked about today went over top of your head, I would strongly encourage you to pick up the theory bundle over my course platform, samuraigutartheory.com. And remember, there are a handful of promo codes if you use promo second greatest at checkout. You'll get anything over there for half off. Thank you all for watching, and especially big thank you to everyone who supports my channel through Patreon. If you're looking for the tabs to my version of Blackbird, you can find them over there. If you want to check out another video like this one, hit that link up there. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, stay tuned for a wide range of music related content. Until next time, Look after each other, look after yourselves, look after the planet. I'm Samurai Guitarist, and I'll see you again soon.